My name is Judy Wilcox and I'm head of the Museum and Study Collection at Central St Martins. Central St Martins was formed in 1989 when the Central School of Art and Design merged with St Martins School of Art. Uh, we are now one of the largest, most comprehensive art schools in the country, teaching a broad range of subjects from art and architecture through fashion and performance to curation and business administration. We currently have just over four and a half thousand students and we're part of University of the Arts London. The teaching collection at Central St Martins was formed in the latter part of the 19th century. And at that stage, there was a notion that aesthetic appreciation was a learned experience. So a number of government funded art schools, including the Central School of Arts and Crafts, the Glasgow School of Art and the National Art Training School in South Kensington, which would later become the V&A, began to gather together objects which they hoped would inspire a generation of makers who might go on to challenge the perceived design hegemony of countries in mainland Europe. So we know from our archives that under the auspices of the first principal of the Central School of Arts and Crafts, the college was collecting a wide range of material which it believed would inspire students to behave in a different way. They were collecting Japanese ukiyo-e prints, German film posters, textiles, rare books, medieval manuscripts. So right from the earliest days of the college, the idea that you might be able to engage with objects in a studio environment and unpick them for intelligence about making techniques or materials was a core part of teaching practice. The collection continued to grow right up until the Second World War when it was put into a basement room for safety purposes and at that stage it was largely forgotten. This very much chimes with the story of other art school collections as increasing student numbers and changes in curriculum fashions um, meant that they became less popular and that there was less demand for them. However, the 1970s saw a rise again in the teaching of art history for art school students and also we see the rise of cultural studies. So at that stage, art school collections really underwent a kind of renaissance. Our collection was effectively rediscovered in the 1980s um, and at that stage the college underwent the huge, the really Herculean task of cataloguing the collection, ordering it, making sense of it and applying to be a, a registered museum. Uh, at that stage we made the decision that rather than collecting art and design more widely because it's a completely huge subject area that the collection really should tell the story of Central St Martins, its staff, its students and its alumni. And at that stage I think the college made a really brave decision to decide to set aside budgets every year to buy work from the student degree shows. So we now have a collection that dates back 30 years in that respect and I think it's really helped me to understand how uh, the acquisition of new technology drives the design language. So what we now have is a collection that includes uh, garments that have been digitally printed, laser cut textiles, uh, digitally printed jewellery, born digital artwork, so you can really see how the acquisition of all that new kit and technology has helped students to make artworks in a very different way. So using those collections to support teaching and learning across the college has always remained a really key aim of the museum and study collection. But teaching practices and um, fashions in the curriculum have changed again over more recent years. And when I arrived and took up post in 2008, I think it's fairly safe to say that the fashion for teaching art history to art students had largely fallen um, from grace. So I was then faced with the challenge of taking this uh, perhaps seen to be rather old fashioned collection and putting it to work in a way that was really relevant to current teaching practice in terms of um, curriculum development. So initially, I will admit that I find that a bit of a struggle. Uh, my background in museums before I came to Central St Martins was national, local government, independent museums. And we struggled in all of those places to attract an audience that was aged between late teens and mid twenties. So I hadn't really met a great deal of the kind of person I was going to meet at Central St Martins. 
a lot of the people that we saw were either younger primary school children or what I would describe as older autodidacts. And particularly older people who have come to learn can be quite a passive audience. They see you in the traditional curatorial model as being the expert in the room and that's what they want to see. They want to see you sharing your best stories and your expertise about the collections with them. But when I came to Central St Martins, I met a body of art school students who were completely different. They're very proactive, they're very challenging, they want to kick back um, and they want to learn actively through doing and making, not through passive looking and listening. Our initial aim was just to get people through the doors. So in the first year of my tenure, my tiny staff team and I were basically doing a huge job of going around all of our academic colleagues in teaching and learning and trying to persuade them to bring their students in for uh, object-based learning sessions in the museum. We did reasonably well. And in that first year, we were enthusiastically sharing textiles with textile students, rare books with graphic designers and we were collecting feedback to see what the user response was and everybody seemed to be having a nice time. However, the students were generally not coming back for independent study, in fact, rarely, if ever at all. And any kind of enthusiasm amongst the teaching staff seemed to be quite short lived. So at the beginning of every academic year, we were having to go the, through the same process of contacting those people again and reminding them that they ought to be bringing their students in. So we had to ask ourselves, what was it that we were doing wrong? And how could we do that better? How could we better support our colleagues in teaching and learning? And so began a long and personal journey for me, trying to take the museum and study collection from where we were, a sort of little known and little used eccentric oddity to where I wanted to be, which was at the heart of curriculum development, supporting teaching and learning across the college. So there have been, I think, four really key turning points in that journey. And the first of those was when we moved from our old buildings in Charing Cross Road and Southampton Row <coughs> to our new building in King's Cross, which we did in 2011. So King's Cross is a really amazing stripped back industrial space. And when we moved there in 2011, we had an opportunity to design both our learning spaces and our display spaces. So those places where you engage with your publics are such an important part of the way you communicate your offer. And where in our old buildings, I suspect that the spaces where we taught and where we displayed our objects confirmed every student's worst notion of what a museum or an archive might be like, fusty, dusty and irrelevant. We were in a small study space based on a second floor bridge going to nowhere with dark there was no natural light coming into the building at all. It was just a really depressing place to be. And in our new space, we have this wonderful, light, bright, airy study room on the ground floor beside the college's new gallery space. Um, and I believe that being in that new place has made a huge difference to the way we engage with art and design students for whom light and space and ambience is a really important part of the way they operate. So being in these new spaces, I think we can have really challenging conversations and begin to show older objects in a new light. The second key turning point for me was undertaking a postgraduate certificate in academic practice, which to all intents and purposes is a teaching qualification for higher education. University of the Arts has a strong tradition of supporting non-academic staff to go through the qualifications. So my colleagues in library services, technicians, museum curators are all offered a chance to undertake this qualification. And for me, it had a really huge impact on my professional practice, not least because I got to spend two years um, hanging out with my professional colleagues, really starting to get under the skin of the discourse of teaching and learning and enabling me to think about ways that I could change my professional practice to better support what they did. I also spent two years exploring different learning theories, which gave me an opportunity to reflect on what I was doing and how I might change it to benefit both um, my teaching colleagues and students. I was struck by the work of early 20th century educational psychologists, including John Dewey and Jean Piaget, 
who established learning as a communal and democratic process, and by Lev Vygotsky, who sees learning as being constructed by the learner. I also read Bruner, who attributed interest and curiosity as being the key motivations for learning, and that really struck a chord with me. But also more recent theorists, including David Kolb, who really fought to establish an education practice that would prepare increasing numbers of students, particularly post-1992, for the world of work, and to help really take those abstract academic con uh, concepts and make them more concrete for the student body. I came to understand the importance of experiential learning, particularly in an art and design context. The fact that we process and recall and understand really quite little of what we read and hear, but so much of what we make and do. I started to take my new understanding of educational theory and place it against my existing understanding of the museum world and of museum educational practice. I was drawing on the work of people like Scott G. Paris, who in 2002 coined the phrase object-centred learning, particularly to address the issue of object engagements in a museum setting. So for Paris, the meaning of an object is not held inherently within the object itself, rather a transaction between the object and the learner allows a space for meaning construction. I began to explore frameworks for helping students to engage with objects more deeply in a way that would foreground their own knowledge and experience. So I drew on the work of Jules Prine, who advocates a sort of staged, really forensic examination of objects, but also on the work of Philip Yenawine and Abigail Hoosen, who came up with the idea of visual thinking strategies. And of course, with Eileen Hooper Greenhill, who writes for the museum community and talks a lot about individual and collaborative meaning making. Most importantly, I stopped showing textiles to textile students and rare books to graphic designers, although we still do a bit of that. But I started to think about showing objects in a more interdisciplinary way on the assumption that the really important thing in an object engagement isn't necessarily discipline specific, but is more rooted in the student's own experience. The third important turning point for me came when I met colleagues at University College London, who at that stage were beginning to unpick the possibilities of object-centred or object-based learning as an academic discipline within higher education. I will always be indebted to my colleagues at UCL for their complete generosity in taking me under their wing, sharing their knowledge with me and encouraging me to begin my own research. And together, we worked together for a year to gather data from several thousand students so we could really start to unpick what was happening when students were engaging in object-based learning sessions and what sort of impact it was having on them. We found that in object-based learning sessions, students were using a variety of transferable skills, including communication, team working, research and analysis. Student feedback suggested that object-based learning was a really good way of addressing troublesome knowledge and also that the multi-sensory aspect of object-based learning sessions was leading to richer, deeper learning experiences. Not surprisingly, we found that in the art school environment, the haptic part of the object engagement, the opportunity to actually handle and feel objects, was seen as a really key part of the embodied learning experience. Gathering all of this data was really useful for me, both in terms of reflecting on my professional practice and improving what I did, but also in terms of arguing for object-based learning in terms of curriculum development and resourcing. So the third key moment came for me when I began to collaborate with Graham Barton, who runs University of the Arts Centralised Academic Support Offer. Graham and I have been collaborating for about four years to design, deliver and evaluate object-based learning sessions. And I would say that the collaboration has brought together two different teaching practices, so museological teaching practice and learning development. 
So Graham and I have been doing a lot of team teaching and while team teaching is incredibly resource intensive, it means having two people in the classroom, it's something that I would advocate because uh, difficult as it is, um, it can be quite an exposing experience to share a classroom with a colleague. There's something about the challenge and compromise of having to deliver workshops together, which I believe can lead to some really innovative outcomes and beneficial outcomes for students. While my area of expertise lies in designing object-based learning sessions which are scaffolded by educational theory to deliver against agreed learning outcomes, Graham has a wealth of experience in terms of academic practices, academic literacies and learning approaches. Where our interests coalesce is in the idea that one might be able to use objects as a focal point for helping students to improve their own learning awareness. So in our workshops, objects have been repositioned as a focal point for meaning making and self-reflection. Marking a move away from traditional curatorial practices, we encourage students to work with objects and really begin to explore their research practices, their habits of mind and their frames of reference. Rather than just talking theoretically, it might be useful for me here to give an example of the way that we work. So our workshops take many different forms. There are all sorts of ways that we can scaffold discussions to try and guide students towards thinking more deeply about their research practices and habits of mind. Um, one of the things that we do is an exploration of the sort of questions that students are asking when they undertake research. So in these kinds of sessions, the whole group will work individually but based on one single object which we placed in the centre of the room. So the students are asked to note the kinds of questions that are arising in their minds. The questions are then analysed according to whether they focus on material or theoretical concerns, um, rash hypotheses, storytelling or more pragmatic assumptions. We can also explore how asking something which is ostensibly a question like I wonder if the person who made this was a female designer, can actually act as an assumption, driving all of the questioning and thinking that follows. So for me, if a student in one of these workshops has a moment where they, they realise that their cultural background or their discipline drives the way they question and think, it's been a really worthwhile session. A second tool that we use is a framework which encourages really deep forensic examination of objects. And this methodology is based on the work of Jules Prown, who actually coined the phrase material culture in the 1980s. So Jules Prown advocated a staged or stepped examination of objects through description, deduction and hypotheses. So we begin by asking the students to list all of the material qualities of the object. We then move on to see what they can deduce from a close examination of the object before encouraging them to move on to grand hypothesising or storytelling around the object. So this exercise is really an exercise in noticing. The students work in groups of three or four and might spend as much as an hour with their object. So they're really starting to get under the skin of the object and think about what it means and what its place in wider society might be. In this session, we talk a lot about collaborative meaning making and respect for difference. We're really keen that students start to get an understanding of how their peers all see and understand objects differently. And I really hope that students start to get a sense of the fact that there are no right and wrong answers and that everybody in this exercise brings something to the table. So there are all sorts of ways that you can structure object-based learning sessions to encourage deeper, more experiential object engagements. The key thing is to be creative and to really make sure that your practice remains focused on the student experience. As we've developed our teaching practice at University of the Arts London, I think we've started to become more confident in the way that we deliver sessions, often changing what we do or changing the objects that we plan to show in response to the student groups when we meet them. We've also set up a community of practice university-wide so that we have a space where we can explore new methodologies, share ideas and learn from one another. Mistakes and successes. So have I achieved my aim of taking the museum and study collection from a little-known oddity to something which sits at the heart of curriculum development across the university? 
Well, there have been some significant successes. Our visitor figures have shot up from the low hundreds to the several thousands. We now see students from pretty much every course across Central St Martins at some point in the academic year. And we see students from the wider university and beyond. So that's all been very positive. Uh, we've also managed to see museum-led projects embedded in the curriculum of a number of courses across Central St Martins. And we teach object literacy to students from all over the university and interdisciplinary groups through the academic support offer. We've even seen object-based learning written into the university's forward plan for learning, teaching and enhancement between 2015 and 2022. However, there remain some challenges. Decolonising a white Western uh, collection remains a tricky business um, and work in this area is ongoing. We do have a number of objects in the collection, such as our Japanese Yukioi prints or Katagami stencils, which are from other cultures, and we try and foreground those in our teaching. And we've got a proactive collecting policy which states that we go out and try to acquire objects which speak to issues of race or gender. So we're making some improvements in that area. We've even borrowed in material from other archives, such as the June Giovanni Pan-African Cinema Archive, to try and give our teaching more breadth and depth. However, although we've been able to hire in teaching staff to teach with us on a case-by-case -case basis, our staff within the museum remains resolutely white and ideally moving forward it would be good for us to have somebody from another culture on the staff so that everything we do including cataloguing represents the voices from other cultures. And do I remain optimistic about the future in terms of what the future holds for teaching collections in the UK? Well, I'm a historian, um, so I look back at the history of teaching collections over the last century and a half, their rise and fall, the way they have a moment in the sun, and then the way they fall from favour again as changes in the curriculum or student numbers um, change the landscape. However, at the minute, teaching collections in the UK seem to be undergoing a renaissance. We seem to have found a moment when material culture is important in teaching practice, and we seem to have found a way of communicating our offer in a way that really proactively supports our colleagues in teaching and learning. I think the really important thing for teaching collections in the UK at the minute is to remain fleet of foot and to make sure that we remain on top of developments in teaching practice and make sure that we don't become moribund. Uh, but with this in mind, I think I remain really optimistic about what the future holds for us.